So our moderator for this panel is Arlene Holt Baker. And joining her in this conversation, we have Algernon Austin, who, as I mentioned briefly, directs EPI's program on race, ethnicity, and the economy, which really is EPI's initiative to advance uh, policies that enable people of color to fully participate in the American economy and to, to benefit equitably from all gains that, that, uh, that result from prosperity. As the director of this program, Algernon uh, authors reports, oversees reports, and policy analyses on the economic condition of people of color. You've probably seen that, that gorgeous mug on all kinds of media outlets talking thoughtfully on issues relating to uh, race in the economy, uh, racial justice. We also have on this panel Mr. Clarence Lang, who is an associate professor of African and African American studies at the University of Kansas. His research interests are particularly appropriate for this panel as they are working class black history, African American social movements, and he is currently working on a volume uh, titled Reframing Randolph, a reassessment of A. Philip Randolph's legacies to labor and to black freedom. So to start off our symposium with lessons learned or understandings about the forgotten history of the March on Washington, I'm now going to turn it over to Arlene. Thank you so much, Clarence. You know, we've said that this evening, again, it's been referenced by a number of us, that in historically people often think of the March on Washington with the I Have a Dream speech of Dr. Martin Luther King. But what has been lost in that is the role that labor played, the role that women played, and the role that the working class played in organizing the march. But specifically, Clarence, I'd like to pose this question to you. I'd like you to share with us the origins of the March on Washington prior to 1963 and the role that labor, A. Philip Randolph, and other labor and civil rights leaders played in what was called then the March on Washington movement. And as you elaborate on that, I'd also like you to elaborate a little bit more on the role that working class people played and a focus on the role that women played. Okay. You're going to have to stop me. Okay. Now, that's, that's, <laughs> I'm going to, I'll, I'll probably answer that over the course of a, of a couple of questions. But, but I'll start by saying I, I think that, that the immediate origins of the 63 March on Washington for Jobs and, and Freedom actually begins during the Second World War. Um, in 1941, uh, when the United States enters the, the, the war uh, against the Axis powers, and the U.S. economy, uh, which had been mired in this depression, uh, begins to mobilize for war, um, what we see are African Americans uh, being continually uh, shut out of uh, well-paying jobs in the defense industries. Uh, then there's also the issue of the ways in which African Americans were marginalized in the military in terms of the roles that they were allowed to play and, and, and not play. Well, A. Philip Randolph, <clears throat> who by this time, and he has, a, he has a history that predates this, so I'm giving you the short, the short answer, who is, by this period of time, I would argue becoming, if he's not yet become, sort of the key uh, black labor leader, certainly, but actually a key civil rights activist. Uh, he's the president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which is the first all-black union to negotiate a contract with a major corporation, in this case, the Pullman Company. And Randolph and his, his cohort, uh, they argue that, that obviously, in a war uh, that's fought against fascism, right, against totalitarianism, against notions of white supremacy, right, that there, there has to be a, uh, some consistency with the goals that are being fought abroad and the practices at home. Uh, and this is part of what people have referred to as a double V campaign, double victory. Victory against fascism abroad, but also victory against Jim Crow, racial apartheid in the United States. And so then he, uh, he, he it, it just sort of develops that something needs to be done. Um, and what occurs is, is that Randolph, through the Brother of Sleeping Car Porters, forms a coalition made up of a number of organizations, uh, the uh, March on Washington movement. And the ultimatum is this, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt is the president at the time, that either the president will end discrimination in the defense industries and the armed forces, or, uh, or the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porter through the March on Washington movement will bring, and the number grows, right? 5,000, 10,000, 
um, people to DC to effectively uh, expose this contradiction in the war effort uh, and to make this demand and, and potentially also, uh, also uh, how would we put it, um, to make very things difficult in terms of business as usual. And make a long story short, Roosevelt issues Executive Order 8802, which outlaws discrimination on the basis of race, national origin, not just African American, but national origin, broadly considered um, in the defense industries. The military is not desegregated. Uh, that comes later. But Randolph accepts this. And so in exchange for this executive order, the march is, is suspended. And there's an agency that's created out of this executive order, uh, the uh, Federal uh, Fair Employment Practice Commission, that serves as a watchdog agency to see that this order is, is, is carried out. Now what happens, and, and I'll wrap up, but, but what happens is that even though the march is suspended, and I think people get this mixed up sometimes, <clears throat> there are chapters of the March on Washington movement that form in cities across the United States. And so while the planned march to DC is suspended, at the local level, I study St. Louis where you have one of the strongest March on Washington movement units in the nation, but other places, Chicago, what, where, what have you, um, what happens is that those local agencies, those local committees, actually take the fight to a local level. So they march on the defense plants because, of course, even with the executive order and, the, and, the, and this agency that's created, well, businesses don't just comply. They have to be forced at the local level. So that becomes the origin, and there's some, there's some, some progress that's made, and by the end of the war, um, the March on Washington movement is, is, is disbanded. So we move forward to the, 19, the later 1940s, Randolph is engaged uh, in similar action around desegregating the military. This occurs during the administration of Harry S. Truman. And so um, many of his contemporaries and people, uh, his contemporaries at the time, are critical of the fact that no march occurs. But to say that it failed, as some had said, have said in the past, I think sort of misses what was happening at the local level. And the significance of that executive order, which is the first sort of major uh, intervention by the presidency since the Emancipation Proclamation is a very important, important moment. And so in some ways the March on Washington that occurs in 1963 is in some respects a fulfillment, uh, a fulfillment of that longer term goal. I want to talk about the, the sort of the latter part of your question, but I want to make sure that, that we, we move along. So you just remind me, because I, I do want to talk about this, 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 the, the importance of working class uh, people labor, and particularly working class women in the movement. So if you'll permit me, I'll, I'll come back to that perhaps? Is that, yes. Okay. Aldenon, we were talking about the history and what happened here, but taking us to 1963, following up on what Clarence was discussing about the movement, you know, some historians have portrayed it that the civil rights movement as an unmitigated success. And so uh, the question to you is, did the civil rights activists think that they had achieved the goals uh, at the end of the 60s? Right, yes, yeah, so there has been, I would say, uh, uh, I think the, an incomplete representation of the civil rights movement. On the one hand, you know, people struggled tremendously, people fought, people died, um, and we did have tremendous success. Uh, because of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. We did get the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, uh, um, in part because of the pressure of the 1963 March on Washington. So that was a tremendous success. Um, unfortunately, however, I feel that some historians have focused just on the success and have kind of ignored everything else. Um, but I feel that if we really want to respect the march and the struggles, uh, the people who fought and died, we have to recognize everything that they hope to achieve. Um, so if you just look at the demands of the march, um, there were at least four of the seven demands that we didn't achieve. And that th those are uh, decent housing. We, we still have problems there. Adequate and integrated education. Our schools are still uh, quite segregated, and they're they're increasing in some area, increasingly segregated. We still do not have full employment, and that was one of the key demands uh, that that motivated A. Philip Randolph, the director of the march, and 
uh, the demand for uh, a living wage, a minimum wage that can lift a family out of poverty, we still, we're still fighting th for that. Today, the minimum wage is less than what it was in 1963. Uh, there is no reason for this country to have a minimum wage that in real dollars is less than what it's 19, in 1963. It's about two dollars, it's a little more than two dollars less than what it was in 1968. Uh, we've had a, a strong and growing economy. Uh, workers are much more productive today than, than they were in the past, and yet our minimum wage is lower than what it was in the 1960s. So that's a real problem. And you can even uh, look to Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, now, uh, Martin Luther King is such a tremendous and powerful figure. What, what you know, we're trying to do talking about A. Philip Randolph, is really recognizing the other leaders. And really in the 40s, as, as Professor Lang was saying, A. Philip Randolph was the leader. Um, you know, after his success with uh, getting, pressuring FDR to, to do the executive order, he was, he was the man. You know, he was the, uh, so it's important to remember that history. But even Martin Luther King, what was he doing when he died? Um, he was fighting for sanitation workers, and he was organizing the poor people's movement. So it's clear that he didn't think he was finished. Um, and neither, I would say, uh, if you look at the demands of the march, uh, it's clear that there are many things that they were hoping for that we have yet to achieve. Can, can I jump on that question? Yes, or may, I, and then I'm just going to ask you a follow-up to that. I, oh, well, well but, but go on. Okay, all right. All right. Well, I, I was, I was going to say that oftentimes when people talk about King's activities in 1968, uh, his support for the sanitation workers' strike uh, and the Poor People's Campaign that he was mobilizing at the time, I think oftentimes people see that as a new development in the movement. And the point is that, in fact, uh, we can see that those kind of politics were shot through the movement even from the beginning. Uh, so if we think, for example, about the Montgomery bus boycott, which for better or for worse, is viewed as uh, a beginning of the modern civil rights movement. Uh, well, that actually, that boycott is built on black domestics, right? Uh, black working class women who rode the buses in Montgomery more than any other group in that city, any other group. And so without them, uh, there would not have been a successful Mon Montgomery bus boycott. So that's there. Uh, King had had interactions with the UAW, the United Auto, Auto, Automobile, uh, Auto Workers. Um, there are the other organizations that Randolph himself created, the Negro American Labor Council, which was a spearhead, in fact, of the 63, uh, of the 63 March, which was geared toward fair and full employment. Um, your presence speaks to one of the, the aims of that particular organization, that the labor movement in its leadership and its structure should be representative of working people in, in the United States. Um, so these things continue all through, uh, all through the movement. And I, and I, I really want to emphasize this point, that I think we can see this even more clearly if we move beyond the national organizations and if we look at the local, the local organizing that occurred. So you will see chapters of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NWCP, which oftentimes we think of as kind of a staid organization, perhaps. I mean, it's a necessary organization, particularly at this moment. But you, you'll see that you have trade unionists who are leading local chapters of the NWCP. Um, the city that I study, there's an individual named Ernest Calloway, for example, who's involved in the Teamsters Union, which is a major progressive political force in that city, right? Jimmy Hoffa notwithstanding, right? Um, and, and, but he's, compli he's complicated, right? But also leading the, the local chapter of the NAACP. You see that in, in a number of different, different cities. Um, the role of black working class women um, who are domestics, who are, um, who are laundresses, um, you have janitors, <laughs> you, have, you have all walks of life, and particularly, again, when we look at the local level, um, certainly the clergy, certainly people who we might consider coming from the stable, black middle class, are certainly there in their roles, but the base of this thing, the base of this movement, certainly in the period that I'm looking at, the 30s through the 70s, is working class, everyday people, inside as well as outside of the labor movement. Even in cases where they were not able to organize through the mainstream labor movement, right? They created their own organizations premised on a working class agenda, a fair and full employment, right? Community colleges, public schooling, 
healthcare on down the line. And so the March on Washington uh, in 1963, again, is a moment that brings together, that sort of represents this grassroots working class base. I wanted to make sure that I said that because that was part of the, the question that you had asked previously. So, That's yeah, right, yeah. and I was gonna bring you back to the role, and especially of the women, and I think you've addressed that, but just in listening to you, certainly when you do think about the, the sanitation workers and you look at that history, mm -hmm. it was the women, the role that they played even then in supporting and making sure that that strike continued and the support. Could you, uh, since I asked you to speak about women, we talked about them generally, but is there a particular whim, woman or women that you could lift up the role that they played uh, in the movement? Uh, some come to mind for me, but certainly those who were part of the March on Washington movement that were working class women and a part of civil rights organizations also. I think in the literature we're learning more of their names. So um, the first person who comes to my mind is, is Ella Baker, um, who played a significant role in creating what I think is the most important organization of that period, which is the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. All these organizations were important. In my view, SNCC, as it was called, was the most important. And that organization really grew out of her efforts to make sure that young people had a space to organize, to make mistakes, and to, and to uh, I mean, they essentially became the stormtroopers of the movement. They went into the Mississippi Delta where other organizations were afraid to go. Um, certainly her, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, out of the Mississippi Delta, uh, sharecropping family, um, who uh, by her own account, by reports, went to school only one day, period, in her entire life. I would argue is probably one of the most eloquent spokespersons for the aims of the movement. The speech that she gave at the Democratic National Convention in 1964, you can, you can YouTube it. You can, if you've not heard it, hear it, uh, because it's the most eloquent statement uh, that, I heard, that I've heard. Courageous woman. I mean, there's definitely, there's definitely her. But again, I think if we move from that national level to the local level, um, the list, it, it grows and, and, it, and it grows. And one of the, the, I would say, one of the most exciting things about being uh, sort of doing this history, being involved in the scholarly production of literature about the civil rights movement, is that we have a, a lot of really good stuff that's coming out that is talking about these local activists who are anonymous for the most part, but without whom you would not have had a national movement. And I think if we sort of go back to the point of, of where we're at today, um, clearly we're at a point where, where we have to begin to think in very, very local terms. Um, that we're at a, at a situation, I, I would say, comparable to where we were, where the action is going to be at the state levels. So whether you're in Kansas, and you know, you know, Kansas is, is I would argue, is a laboratory um, for some of the worst stuff that's happening. Um, but that's what happens if your goal is to be Texas. You know what I mean? So you, you follow, you follow, as it's been stated by the governor of that state. You know, the, you know, we're going to follow Texas. So I hope I have a job when I get back. But you know, I'm tenured, so I should be, I should be fine. But, yeah, but, yeah. Can I just jump in? Um, I think talking about the role of women in the March in Washington movement, uh, there's a new book by William Jones titled The Mark and Mo March in Washington that's released today that does an excellent job about talking about women um, in the March in Washington movement. And, and one woman that he highlights who worked with A. Philip Randolph uh, around trying to make the Fair Employment Practices Committees permanent was Pauli Murray. Yes. Um, and she worked with, with, with A. Philip Randolph. She was also one of the pioneers in civil disobedience. Um, in 1940, she was arrested on a bus for refusing to give up her seat. Um, we know that that's an important action in, in, in civil rights history, but she was one of the, the pioneers. And she was also part of the Workers' Defense League. Um, she has a long history. Uh, but she's one of the, the women that, that uh, William Jones lifts up in, in, in his book. And I guess from the historical perspective, we must recognize that there were, there was not one woman that right. had a speaking role mm -hmm. at the 1963 March on Washington. Uh, there was one that had uh, a role of introducing other women, mm -hmm. but not any woman that had a speaking role. But I think we've come a far cry from that and so, yeah, <laughs> today. You know, I'd like to, uh, Algernon, ask you, we, we, I, 
Congressman spoke to the need for coalition. We all up here have talked about the need for coalition. We're starting to see now in the last two years, uh, I'd say a number of marches, if you will, uh, workers taking to the street around the right to be able to be able to bargain, uh, immigrants taking to the street for the need for comprehensive immigration reform, those who are taking to the street to push for marriage equality. Uh, and recently, certainly, we have seen uh, young people, their parents and their community take to the street around Trayvon Martin. Yes. My question to you is, is there an opportunity to link these issues together? And do we have what I would call not just a moment around issues, but is there an opportunity to build a movement? Oh, that's a really tough question. <laughs> but I, I well, would that's actually, why I gave it to you. <laughs> I would actually go back to Congressman Ellison's point, where he said that there were no allies. And really, the issue of the economic crisis that we're facing is really broad-based. Um, and, and it really links, it, it's a thread that, that, that we've weaves through all of the issues that you, you, concern, that you mentioned. So uh, one of the groups that are most exploited in the labor market today are the undocumented immigrant population because they're undocumented. Um, so uh, addressing their needs from a labor perspective is really important. Young people, again, another group that is suffering tremendously um, given the, the weak economy. Um, uh, you, you know, so I think very broadly we're, we're in a, a serious economic crisis that affects uh, groups across the line. The, the incarcerated and the ex-offender ex population have, very, again, a very difficult time finding work within this economy. And we really need, I think, the spirit of the March on Washington, you know, was that, look, we need a job, we need to pr provide a job for everyone who wants to work. And I think people across all demographic groups uh, are, are facing that struggle today about how can we uh, find a job given the, this economy. And, but also, once we have full employment, uh, that, that um, brings benefits uh, uh, across the board. You know, when we have a tight labor market, wages grow up, and some of that concentration of, of income and wealth that Congressman Ellison talked about can be reversed by having uh, a full employment economy. But let me ask you, Clarence, when you think about the kind of following up to what um, Algernon has laid out, when you think about the activity that you see in communities today, and you're talking about the need for a local movement to start locally and we can build it nationally, what do you believe are some of the sparks that are out there that give you hope that we could really build a movement that continues uh, the march and ultimately finishes it. So I'll start with the fact that it was mentioned earlier about the food service workers. Um, I'm seeing in my local community in the metropolitan area where I live in Lawrence, Kansas, but this is sort of part of the Kansas City metro area, there's a lot of activity that's beginning to percolate on that. Um, so I see people, see people moving in, in, in that direction. I think uh, if, we, if we think about the um, sort of the aftermath of this recent Supreme Court ruling on the Voting Rights Act. I think that that creates, it's a crisis, but it also creates possibly, not possibly, it creates an opportunity, I think, for people to go back to the woodshed to organize. And I think part of the organization has to be obviously around restoring the vote, right? Sort of protecting that, fighting back against these voter ID laws. But as part of that, as part of that, um, and taking back the vote, the importance of, of taking the vote back, which is why there's been attempts to shrink the electorate, is that we have at stake the right to collective bargaining. And so that has to be part of the agenda as well. That the, the reason why we need to take back the vote is because we know that, um, for example, this rising American electorate that people speak about, um, people of color, women, they make up a very dynamic segment of the labor movement. Uh, if we think about service workers and the like. So these things are, I would argue, 
are very much interconnected. So the right to vote collectively uh, to collectively bargain. And in fact, there's, there are some folks who are making the argument that given the attacks recently that have occurred on the, um, the, National, um, the National Labor Relations Board, that perhaps one of the agendas might be uh, making the right to vote, uh, amending local state level civil rights laws to include the right to vote as well. How that will play out, we'll see. That's a political question. But I, I think that, that these things are, are, are certainly interrelated. I would argue that the biggest key now, I would argue, um, is this issue of mass incarceration. I mentioned this at, at, at the luncheon. Because in fact, I would argue you don't have a Trayvon Martin situation without the phenomenon of mass incarceration, which brought in his wake racial profiling and this reinscription of black criminalization. And so I think we have, our, we have our plate full, and we have to find ways where when we're talking about race, we're talking about class. When we're talking about class, we're talking about gender and race. Because indeed, if we think, for example, uh, the issue of, of, of a woman's right to choose, I'll just go there. Um, that's an issue that has to do with race, and it's certainly an issue that has to do with class in terms of the, the decision that people make about their bodies and what have you. And so it's not an issue of race here, class there, gender there, sexuality over there, that these things are oftentimes colliding, perhaps, but I would say just as often intersecting and finding those, those moments where we can see these things coming together. The food service, workers are one. Um, the vote, I think, very much critical to that. And also, if I might add very, very quickly, this issue, I think everyone, whether you're black or white, we all have an issue, uh, we, all, we all have an interest at stake and, and really sort of fighting back against this kind of, um, of this, this sort of sanctioning of arbitrary violence. Because I would argue that as, as an African American historian, black people have historically been a laboratory on which right, things for better and for worse are worked out that affect the rest of the population. So if we think about the ability of people to shoot down someone who is minding his own business and to walk away with an acquittal, let's not think that that doesn't have, for example, the possibility of coming back on people who are organizing for collective bargaining rights. Let's not forget that the labor movement in the United States was one of the most violent periods in the world. Those struggles that took place in the late 19th century. And so if we allow this kind of tragedy to occur and that becomes a precedent, there's nothing to say that when people are organizing for the right to unionize, for collective bargaining, that those, form of violence, that those forms of violence won't be visited on them as well. Thank you. Algernon, at EPI, you think a lot about the policy piece and the con connecting it to policy. But again, thinking about the moment that we're in mm -hmm. and the opportunity to address the concerns of so many that are crying for freedom, whether it's the women in Texas and Virginia, the workers in Wisconsin, and lately certainly the bankruptcy in Michigan. How do you, how are you thinking about how do we have a, the narrative that links up the justice piece to the economics? Again, you're giving me all the easy questions. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's a, that's a really tough question. And I think, um, again, we have to go back to the broad, the broad vision that A. Philip Randolph had. Um, you know, and, and for him, you know, the, the issue of, I mean, it, it was completely interconnected, right? Uh, the issue of the exclusion of black workers from the defense, is, defense industry was both uh, a racial justice issue and an economic justice issue. Um, you couldn't separate them. Um, and I think many of, as I said before, many of the, the struggles that we're facing today um, are connected to the economic inequality that we're seeing, are connected to the disempowerment of, of, of the American public in, in many ways. I mean, um, again, to go a little bit off, off, off the, the central topic, I mean, with the, the um, uh, President Obama's recent attempts to get gun control legislation. You have the majority of the public 
in support of some type of reform, and yet it doesn't pass. Um, and that's unfortunately uh, connected to, again, something that uh, Congressman Ellison talked about, the, the influence of money and, and lobbyists in, in politics. So we have a real crisis in our democracy right now. Um, and you know, one of the important sort of countervailing forces is, is labor. Um, unfortunately, that's why labor is under attack, right? Um, so we really need to do more to broaden a host of issues, a host, host of organizations. I mean, traditional civil rights organizations. But um, it's, it's also crucial that we figure out how to strengthen and expand labor. Uh, because as the March in Washington uh, movement shows, uh, many other pro progressive movements are connected um, to the labor movement. Uh, so, so that's part of the struggle. We, we need to build movements at the grassroots, and, and particularly, I would say, the, the labor movement, because the crisis that, that's being broadly shored now is the economic crisis, but also a lot of the civil rights struggles are connected to, to the labor struggles and to the growing uh, economic inequality that we're seeing in the country today. Absolutely. This question I'm going to pose to the both of you. Uh, if you had, and it could be several, but if you had one economic policy that you would propose that we move to give an opportunity uh, to young people of color so that they could have hope for their economic future, what would that be? You go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have to choose only one. That's, that's. Well, I could give you two. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm gonna go back to, to the full employment, right? Because, um, you know, it, the, I think the, the outlook of young people today would be so different if they knew that when they finished high school or finished college, they could get a, a good job. Um, you know, and I think if you were to ask them what they wanted, I think that would be uh, certainly, if not number one, certainly in the top three of, of, of their concerns. Um, you know, and unfortunately, if you're looking at, at young people of color, young African Americans, young Latinos um, in particular, uh, when they're faced with, with quite high levels of unemployment, that increases the likelihood uh, that they may in, get involved or entangled with the criminal justice system. Uh, so making sure that those young people have a job um, will have positive effects in a, in a in a multitude of ways. I, I agree completely with that. I mean, this is, and he's made it so easy for me to agree with him. But I mean, but I think fair and full employment solves a lot of problems. So I mean, in terms of most of, I mean, if we think about the people who fill in our prisons, these are nonviolent drug offenses of people trying to patch together a living um, through means that, that sometimes are legal and other times aren't. Employment is, is, is the key, I would argue. I would have to agree with that, that if they had uh, a future of employment. At living that, wages. At living wages. With union really protection. Good. And I was going to say, but they have to have that right to have the voice at work. We have yes, to add that yes, in yes. there. Would help guarantee it. I think we're going to probably running out of time, but uh, this is a question I'd like to pose to the two of you. Just in looking historically, we started talking about A. Philip Randolph. And I'm reminded that A. Philip Randolph, in fact, was able to meet with five presidents, Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, Johnson, and uh, Kennedy and Johnson. And so I ask the two of you, if A. Philip Randolph were alive today and he were able to meet with President Barack Obama, what do you think that conversation would be like? <laughs> I'll let you go first. Okay. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. I, I, I mean, I, I think first of all, we, we, you know, we'd have to recognize that if A. Philip Randolph were meeting with President Obama, it wouldn't be because he wanted to have coffee and conversation. 
when he met with U.S. presidents, he was coming to ask and demand something. So we have to be cognizant of that. And so I would, I would, I, I would imagine Randolph saying something to the effect in his baritone voice. You know that you know the only time that the U.S. presidency has been uh, an effective ally of people who are struggling for whatever goal they're struggling for is when there was some pressure. And so, first of all, congratulate them. You know, <laughs> congratulate them. He said, so I'm going to do you a favor, and um, I'm going to make it easy for you to uh, help perhaps shepherd through an American Jobs Act. And so uh, tomorrow, don't be surprised when you see uh, <laughs> me at a press conference announcing that we're going to stage <laughs> a march on Washington unless there's some effective executive action taken. And good day to you, sir. You know, so that's, <laughs> that's my guess, right? That's my guess. I agree. And say hello to Michelle. <laughs> I agree completely. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he, he would clearly, you know, for him, you know, he said, Look, looking out in 1963, I see six million black and white people unemployed and millions more in poverty. Um, today, there are 12 million people of all races unemployed and millions more in poverty. He would say, think that there's a lot of work to be done. And, and like uh, Professor Lang says, he recognizes that you have to put pressure on the administration to, to get motion. But I, I think he would not necessarily focus simply on Obama. I mean, it's Congress, right? You know, uh, Obama proposed the, the American Job Act, but there is tremendous op opposition in Congress. So I think he would mobilize to really put pressure uh, to lift up the issue of jobs and to try to, to get those Congress people to pay attention to, to working people. Thank you. And I guess in thinking about that, would President Obama say to him, make me do it, <laughs> as other presidents said to uh, Randolph. I think we are, don't have very much time. We had wanted to have an opportunity with one or two questions, but I don't know if we have that time yet, Christian. But uh, if you tell me we have a second or at least a minute or two, we're going to uh, have some very fortunate person uh, be able to pose a question to our panelists. And since we won't have the mic, if you could just repeat it. Okay, I will. So if you're, no burning questions, not comments, but questions. <laughs> yes, I see the young, young man here. Say, No, could you question re repeat the question, please? If I heard it, he was asking if we thought the federal government was still capable of moving forward in terms of good policy and, and us being able to mobilize in a way to make it happen. I yeah. think that was the question posed. This is a good, good question. And obviously, we're in very different times than, than Randolph uh, is. I mean, clearly, the, the government is, is dysfunctional um, by design, I think, in, in, in some respects. And so really, I think that, that the, 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 I think the key right now is, is, is that I don't know that the federal government at this point in history, at this moment, is the vehicle for the kinds of changes that we might be envisioning and imagining. And I really do come back to the fact that we're, we're back to where people were in Montgomery in 1955, where we have to figure out, you have to fight where you're standing. And whether that's in Kansas, whether that's in New York State or Michigan, what have you, I think that we have to begin to, to build and dig where, where we stand. That's the best that I can do. Yeah, yeah I would. I agree. You know, are, are we right now? We have a highly dysfunctional democracy, uh, but we still, as as individuals, as voters, we still do have power. Um, I think it's the the issue is a matter of mo mobilizing um, to put pressure on the the places where our our, our democracy is stuck. Um, so I think there, there needs to be more organizing, more conscious, consciousness raising to address the problems that make, make it difficult for our democracy to, to function. 
uh, properly. But I, I, I think it's possi possible, but yes, it's quite difficult. There wasn't a possibility for the Civil Rights Act in 1964 without first fair employment laws in various states where people were able to get them passed. And I think that that's the key, again. I think this is going to wrap up our uh, panel. Uh, and I would just say thank you so much, you. Professor Lang. Thank you so much, Ajanan, for uh, being a part of this. I think it's been a rich discussion. It's a con discussion that must continue among all of us. We understand that the march is not finished. There is still so much work for us to do if we're going to ultimately have the kind of freedom and shared prosperity for all of Americans. Let us commit ourselves to finishing the march. Thank you so much. Thank you.